All right, good evening. Beautiful day. A uh, little bit different setting this evening. I did not get the air conditioners in the uh, normal room. Got to turn it on and I decided not to fight it. It's nice and cool where I am, so if you can see, you can see the Sword of Solomon in the uh, background. It was uh, originally a gift to uh, Pastor Kim, who was the one that licensed me into ministry. And when she passed, her sister, Aunt Kathy, gave it to me. And I am honored to display it. So again, all glory to God. It is an incredibly wonderful, beautiful day. We definitely needed the rain. Uh, that we've been getting off and on, but I uh, feel sorry for uh, people that had to be out in it. But anyway, it's all good. We definitely needed some of it. But uh, Tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 22. Uh, this will wrap up the book of Revelation. And... Uh, I believe we're going to uh, be going next week into the book of Romans, and I'm quite sure uh, it will be as equally fascinating and maybe a little more understandable uh, than this book. Uh, but anyway, we are in Revelation 22 this evening. And with that said, I'm going to pray and dive in and on in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We ask, Father, once again, it be all of you and none of me tonight, Father. Excuse me. Give me revelation knowledge of the words that John penned for us to read until the time that they actually come to pass. And the Son returns in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. And you'll have to pardon me for just one moment. This has been a crazy day. I have to get do not disturb on. I hope that doesn't mess with it too much. There we go. Do not disturb. All right. So, Revelation 22, and I have the scripture beside me, so. I'd be turning my head a little bit tonight. Uh, but anyway, all glory to God. Let's go right on into it here. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall, shall serve him. I'm going to read down through this and just kind of speak as led, and then I will read a bit of the commentary, okay? And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Unlike the mark of the beast, his name will be in our foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the, for the Lord God giveth him light, them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The Lord God gives us light. We, we saw in the previous chapter that God is the light in the new city. And it's the only light we will need, and it will be continuous light. There won't be any need for us to rest, so to speak. We will, we will be 
active 24. But as a matter of fact, in all reality, in heaven, time doesn't even exist. We won't realize how long we've been there. The, the song is true, Amazing Grace. You know, I did a sermon on that song one time, talked about that every, every verse is from Scripture. And it says, one of the verses says, when we've been there 10,000 years, we have no less time because it won't end. I, I know it was difficult for us to wrap our minds around that, but that's the reality of it. 10,000 years from now in heaven, we'll, have, we'll still have eternity. Yeah, there is no end, and that's, yes, okay. Let me not dwell on that too long. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is, is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. We, will, we should, can never deny it. Okay. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith, then saith he unto me, See, thou do not, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. In other words, he's saying, I'm not to be worshipped. I am, I am your fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So he's saying, worship God. We, we, we get wrapped up in our idols here on earth sometimes, and most of us have done it, but we are told to worship God. We don't worship money. We don't worship uh, an earthly relationship. We don't worship our possessions. Okay? We worship God. Okay. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He's saying, Don't hide this. We saw in the book of Daniel and some others where they were told to seal them up until a given time. And John is being told here that everything that he's being shown in this revelation this is to be released immediately. You've all seen probably TV shows for immediate release and this is okay. This is what the angel's saying. There's no need for you to hold on to this. You can release this now. And quite honestly, that fits quite well into the environment and into life today as we're seeing the beginnings of these things. And we certainly can't hold on to it any longer, and that's why I know that's why the Lord told me, uh, what, 20 some weeks ago to go into the book of Revelation because we are beginning to see these things happen. And I, I'm looking back, you know, I recall the chapters two and three where it talked about the different churches, and I posed the question back then which church are you? And you need to examine that and make sure that you fit properly into the church that was doing things as they should have been uh, in those chapters. Because 
the future chapters are unraveling now. And Jesus has to be preparing. I can't, I can't see, you know, if I could get a vision of heaven, I would almost see Jesus in, in anticipation of his father releasing him to come, come get us. I, there may be some, some things, there may be some steps to be taken yet, but I quite honestly, you know, like even at my age, believe it could be in my lifetime. That's just how close I feel, and I'm not the only one that feels this, that Jesus must be certain soon to return, okay? He that is unjust, let him let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So he's, he's basically saying, let people be what they are. At this point in time, You've kind of you you kind of ran out of time, and so be what you are. That is what he's saying. And then Jesus Himself began to speak these words, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work, according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So he's saying, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And that's referring back to the previous, you know, let the filthy be filthy, let the unjust be unjust, let the righteous be righteous. He's saying his, he's coming to reward each of us according to who we are, so is, is one way to look at it. Okay. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have, may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For... For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. We see this this same thing throughout Scripture. He's saying here they're not going to get in. Then when he says for without are, and then goes into all these things, sorcerers, whoremongers, without. They are not in the gates. They cannot enter the gates of the city. They have no right. They, they have no, should have no expectation because they have been cast into the lake of fire. And so there's no more hope. They can't get in then and they never will get in. So that's why I say, choose, as Scripture says, choose this day whom you will serve. And I would add to that, choose wisely. Choose wisely. Okay. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And I am the root and the offspring of David, and, and the bright and morning star. Now, I will say this again, and I've said this many times. There is a translation of the Bible that refers to Satan as the morning star in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and then turns around and duplicates what this translation says 
calling Jesus the morning star. In, in, did I say Revelation 14, 12? It's Isaiah 14, 12. And here in Revelation 22, 16, we see Jesus being called the morning star, which he is, in fact, the true morning star. And, you know, I heard it explained to me one time, well, you know, Rev or, uh, Isaiah is in lower case. And that's fine. That works for somebody that is mature in the word and was, has recognizes that. But the vast majority of the people won't even catch that, especially younger Christians. I see so many people wanting to start out a baby in Christ in this NIV translation. Yes, I'm going to go there. Okay. And I highly discourage that. Highly discourage because it, even though a seasoned Christian may be able to pick up on and explain some of that, that stuff, I would not recommend it for as a study Bible for anyone, number one, and especially for a babe in Christ because it can, can and will bring confusion. Sorry, I just had to get that out there. Okay. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So, what do we see here? We see choice again. You know, people look at me funny sometimes when I say, when I say God is pro-choice. And I, I'm not saying he condones abortion or anything or that, but he allows people to make that choice for which there are consequences. We see the same thing here. Come and let him that is, uh, is a thirst come. Choice. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Choice. Okay? So, yeah, I have, you know, there's a whole sermon on that as far as choice is concerned. But God doesn't want puppets. He doesn't want to have to demand. He gives us commandments, but it's our choice whether we follow them or not. And again, it is my job to get people to understand there are consequences. There are bad consequences for not following and good consequences for following. But again, we see, even here in the very last book of the Bible, it is choice. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now this refers to plagues throughout the book, but there are plagues in, I oh, forgive me, I think it's, I know it's the book of Deuteronomy, and I'm, I'm believing it's chapter 22, where it talks of the plagues. Okay? And it goes on to say, God shall take away his... Um, let me start it. Okay. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Okay. So he's saying we're not to add to and we're not to take away. Now, there is some uh, disagreement, shall we say, among believers that he's referring specifically to this book, the book or of Revelation, which is the vision of John, okay, or given to John. 
or does this apply to the entire Bible? And quite frankly, he may have, in, in when this was written, okay, he may have been referring to this book of Revelation. But I'm here to tell you today that there are other places in the in the scripture that tells us not to add to or take away. So does that statement apply to the book of Revelation? Yes. Does, does it apply to the whole word? Yes. You can't. Are there plagues for taking or adding to some of the other books? You know, you take that up with God. I wouldn't take that chance, quite frankly. Okay, why would you? I mean, to me, it's just I can't. Why would someone want to take that chance? Why would someone want to add to or take away? Now, quite honestly, there are denominations, Christian denominations, that have taken away from this, not the book of Revelation necessarily, but taken things out of the out of their doctrine. And I would I personally I would not want to answer for that. That's me. You know, if you want to say things are no longer valid in the Bible, or you want to say, well, that was for back in the day, and it doesn't apply today, well, you you go ahead and say that, but don't don't even try to come get me to buy into it, because I'm not. If you're taking away from what you know, a good example, tongues and interpretation, or prophecy, there are denominations that don't believe in that. To me, that's taking away. Okay? I'm, I, I will stick to my, I have stuck to my guns on that for many, many years, and I will continue to stick to them because I have studied it up one side and down the other, and nowhere in Scripture can I find that it says that those things were done away with. The only place it even remotely refers to that the things that will be done away with, the circumstances involved in that have not happened yet. And that's when Jesus returns. We won't have need for prophecy when Jesus comes comes and gets us and we're all heaven. Well, no. You know, the scripture is being referred to is in Colossians. And it says, now we know in part, then we'll know in full. And people use that to establish their doctrine is this stuff has passed away. But to believe that, you have to believe that Paul was perfect, if you continue to read. Because it says, when the perfect one comes, he ain't come yet. And it wasn't referring to when his birth, because it was written after his ascension. Anyway, let me, just a little side note though, I didn't mean to get too far down that rabbit trail, but let's, let's read on. And he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is not a complicated book, and it has not taken us long to get through it. Uh, or this is a chapter, I should say. I, to me... It is a one of probably one of the most clear cut chapters in the entire book of Revelation outside of the first three. Okay. And where it's primarily talking to uh, the seven churches. And so I will read a bit of the commentary. Some of it is probably going to be duplication of things that I have said, but I will read it and just, and just maybe we can pick up another point or two. Okay. John sees a river, sees a river of the water of life. This contrasts with the pollution and decay seen during the tribulation or earlier chapters. It also echoes the original state of the Garden of Eden. 
Water and life are often intertwined in Scripture, especially in the writings of John. The city also contains a tree of life, something from which fallen men was specifically fallen man was specifically barred after the fall. Talking about Adam and Eve, of course. The reference to the leaves being used for healing leads some to suggest that the New Jerusalem will exist somewhere above earth prior to the end of the millennium. Others see this as a symbolic reference to permanent eternal health and life. Again, you can there are multiple ways and multiple thoughts even in this chapter. So I will remind you probably not for the 22nd time, but of probably at least the 40th or 41st or 40th whatever. You know, I know I've done it at least twice in, in many of the chapters. Bottom line. The bottom line thing is there is going to be a new Jerusalem. The bottom line thing is people that have participated in evil aren't going to be there. Very simple, okay? Light as well is a crucial metaphor in the Bible representing truth and knowledge. God and Jesus are full, so full of truth and knowledge that they'll be the light of the new city. They are so full that their light will shine so brightly there won't be any need for a sun or a moon or any other type of light. They will be the light. Frankly, you were called to be light. Revelation then ends its description of the future and returns to more immediate commands from Jesus. The angel commends what John has seen as accurate and worthy of trust. This is followed by a statement reiterating the idea that I am is coming soon. We saw in the Old Testament. He said, I am, I am. And that's why I say, when you say I am, followed by a negative, you are taking God's name in vain. If you say I am sick, you've just used I am in a negative manner. I'll leave that one go for now. This might have confused John, seeing as the words are those of Jesus, but it had been the angel speaking up to that point. Perhaps in confusion, John starts to worship the angel. It is immediately corrected. We, you recall that. We just read it. John is then told not to seal up the words of Revelation. And this is one of the things that I pointed out. Okay. Unlike older prophets such as Daniel, John's visions come when there are a few remaining events left between the prophecy and its fulfillment. These words are to be shared and understood, not guarded. We talked about that as well. The reference to evildoers and the righteous is not an endorsement of sin. Rather, it's an expression that Jesus' return is inevitable and unavoidable. Okay. Likewise, we are reminded that those who demonstrate their rejection of Christ through persistent, unrepentant sin will find themselves separated from God. We saw that in this very chapter. It is throughout Scripture. You know, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 says you will not, you know, it goes through a list of things. It says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm sorry. You know, there are people that saying, well, again, they're saying, well, that was for back of the day. 
or well that doesn't fit society today. But you know what? I have just I have just racked my brain and, and just pounded the scriptures looking for the one that says, well, we can twist scripture and change it to match society today. I've looked and looked for that, and you know what? I can't find it. And I know I can't find it because it doesn't exist. There, nowhere in Scripture, and I mean nowhere in Scripture, does it say that any of this will ever change. It simply, it says, quite frankly, that not, not one single dot, not one single period of His Word will ever pass away. It equates it to heaven and earth may pass away. But my basically, my word won't. That's what Scripture says. Other Scripture says He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And guess what? Today is part of that ever. It's part of that today as well. And, and so we can't even we can't even change one little dot because society thinks it's changed. I, and I, I'm not going to get in. No, Lord, please don't let me go there. Let me pick on a different sin. There are so many things today. You know, I see it in politics. There was a time when, yeah, politicians all make promises. But there was a time when they were sincere promises. <laughs> okay. And it's... People have changed. We have become an accepting society, and society is trying to tell us that the church should be more tolerant and should be more accepting and inclusive. And I forget the words they use, but they're trying to tell us that, that you know, and I'm sorry, but what God said was sin 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago is still sin today. But the, I know you all recall the woman that was caught in adultery. And that was sin. Okay? Well, guess what? It's still sin today. We, we see, and I, I, I promised I was going to break down the laws one of these days, the Old Testament laws. Some of that stuff still applies. Are, are, are you supposed to steal? Just because we're under a new covenant, is stealing no longer sin? Yes, it's still sin. And so, you know, that scripture still applies. I don't care when it is. So, the things we're being told to accept today, is that not doing exactly what we are warned not to do? Are we not changing the word of God? Uh, let me... Yeah, verses 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophets saith this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plex. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophet, God shall take away his part in the book of life. And so when you take that part out, that says this is sin, and we because society accepts it now, you're taking away from the book. You, I mean, did he not say in, in earlier, uh, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie? Among, you know, and we see in scripture, other scriptures, the list goes on. You can't change that. I don't care how hard you try. You have to blindly twist the word, have your head in the sand to try to take things that were sin and say they no longer are. Don't push that mess on me because I'm not receiving it. If it was sin in, it's sin now. I don't care what society says. 
I don't care how we've changed. I don't care what laws they write. This word is not changing. And I am not going to change either on my views of sin. I'm not, I'm not, I refuse to accept what is trying to be shoved down our throat today, which again, like I said, in turn is changing the Word of God. My, let me go back to, and I know most of you by now, unless you just absolutely have not watched any news, not talked to anybody in the past several days, you saw the opening of the Olympics, the opening ceremony. And so many people were so highly offended and all that. And first of all, the guy come, the guy that designed it came out and said, it really was not representative of the Last Supper. I didn't study enough to so, say that I can repeat what he said it was. But when I heard about it, it hurt me. And because, the reason it hurt me was because, first of all, they were making, if in fact it was representative of the Last Supper, it was outright blasphemy. But my response to that was not to hate them, because that is not a Christian response. The res proper response is for your heart to hurt for them. Because it should be your desire that none should perish. In addition to that, why are you offended? It wasn't against you. If in fact it was a, a mockery of the Last Supper. But what I initially said Sunday was this. I was encouraged by it because it is the prophetic word of the Bible of end times coming to pass. No, I don't hate. No, I mean, was I disturbed by it? Kind of. Was I upset? Frankly, yes. But I was. But it was because I don't want to see anybody go to hell and yet knowing what scripture says and all this stuff must happen then I go back to this these last couple of verses he which testified these things saith, surely I come quickly amen and then that those are actually those words are actually in red in in most red letter bibles okay but then it goes on to say amen even so come lord jesus that's my response let's win as many souls as possible in the time we have left but understand we can't change this word we have to recognize it playing out in front of our eyes. There's not much more I can say, but I will remind you one more time just to make sure I get it in twice. When you, when you read this book of Revelation, first of all, when you're going to stay, you can do a Google search and you'll find at least a very minimum of two different uh, theologies on, on some of the scriptures, okay? Individual scriptures or, or in context scriptures, okay? Uh, we, I've tried to point out some of them as we went through, but we have to maintain that bottom line. This stuff is happening. Jesus Christ is going to return. And tonight I would say it's critical that we don't add to the Bible or take away from the Bible 
And we can't change the Bible. Because in all reality, when you change it, you're doing both. Or at least one. You know, if you if you take this part of, of the Bible out as, and because it doesn't match the doctrine that you choose, you're making God fit you. And you are, in fact, taking away from it. Or if you add to it. But more so if you change. If you take it and you change it, and this happens probably more often than the, the entity of the other, when you change it and twist it, you're doing both. You're taking away the truth and adding your opinion. And that's not going to work. We're not called to make God fit us. That's basically what it boils down to. We are called to fit God. We are called to fit what God said. All right, all glory to God. That does, in fact, conclude the book of Revelation. Uh, I, We will start... Uh, Romans next week, uh, maybe next week, uh, it depends, uh, well, it's just, just suffice it to say that I feel like maybe a sabbatical is in order, uh, but we'll see, that, you know, God may change my mind between now and then, but whenever we start next, be it next Tuesday or the following, we will start in the book of Romans. All right? All glory to God. I pray that this has helped you this evening. And again, go back and study this. And again, make sure you do it with that bottom line mentality. All the theorizing and the theologians with this opinion and that opinion, frankly, mean nothing. What means everything is that bottom line. So I encourage you to keep that in mind. There, I got it in three times tonight. With that said, God bless you all. Of course, we love you. You cannot do anything about it. And I believe Tamara will be here Thursday with the word. Uh, please keep her and her family in prayer. Prayer. There was a death of a cousin last week. And... Uh, she is with them at the moment. So, But anyway, uh, all glory to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. I just give you all praise and honor and glory for having taken us through, through the book of Revelation, Lord. I pray that we have learned from it. I pray that we have increased our knowledge of you from it. I pray that we've drawn closer to you, Father, that, of course, you will in turn draw closer to your to us, honoring your very word. And as we close tonight, Father, may you continue to be the head of our lives and lead us to that point where we can, in fact, enter into eternity with you one day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Again, God bless you all. Whoa. We love you and you cannot do anything about it. God bless. I'm trying. It won't let me end it.